I welcome you to Partners for Law and Development's archiving series, Ways of Seeing and Being, that spotlights movements and practices that are defining of feminist visions of law and justice. This episode looks at the feminist mobilizing and cross-national solidarities on the comfort women issue through the mid-1990s across East and Southeast Asia to hold Japan accountable for sexual slavery and rape during the World War II. At a time when rape was viewed as collateral damage instead of a crime in international law, the Comfort Women Movement in Asia, together with the feminist efforts at the International War Crimes Tribunal for former Yugoslavia in 1993 and International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in 1994, changed the law definitively. Rape and sexual slavery came to be recognized as weapons of war amounting to war crimes. Yet the mobilizing of comfort women was not animated purely by the need for law reform. At the heart of the extensive regional solidarities was the painstaking effort to identify comfort women, create a community for and with them, to break silences and begin processes of individual and collective healing. Of the many feminists whose unstinting efforts shaped this movement uh, is Indai Sajor, a guest in this episode. She is in conversation with Miho Suji. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the two of them, both part of the Comfort Women movement. Indai Sajor has worked over 30 years in contexts of war and conflict in Asia Pacific, Africa and the Middle East, on issues of women, peace and security through the UN and international organizations. Her work as the convener of the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal on Japan's military sexual slavery marked the beginning of her very important journey in the field of women, peace and security in which she continues to work to this day. Miho Suji is a performance artist creative director, producer, and educator. Miho's work strives for regeneration of life in moments of destructions, creating a seamless line between her art and social intervention. Her stories draw on her own experiences relating to generational impacts of war, nuclear disaster, as well as gender and cultural hybridity. Her work, she has worked with women survivors of conflicts around the world, particularly comfort women, and was associated with Women's Caucus for Gender Justice during the establishment of the International Criminal Court. Over to you, Miho and Indai, to begin the conversation. Um, thank you, Madhu. Um, um, Indai, um, so... 50 years of silence after the World War II. And in 1991, uh, Korean survivor Kim Hak Soon broke the silence to testify the crimes of sexual slavery that the Japanese military has committed. You have led the comfort women movement. I've uh, walked with you, I've witnessed uh, your strides uh, in Japan and inter, you know, international work. Um, it's been 20 years and I, and today we are walking through the movement once again. So um, let me start with the question um, of how the movement started and your encounter with the Korean activists and how you started yeah. uh, your movement in the Philippines, taking down your first testimony yeah. and the road ahead. Thank you, Miho. 90, 90, 90, 91, we're 92, leading to 93, were great years um, uh, for the women's movement because it was the year that we all started to talk about the different issues our countries were facing. You know, in Asia, the issue of sex trafficking of women, male order bride, um, and the issue of domestic violence and how to handle domestic violence was really um, in, in, in the national stage. So, um, 
and not to mention um, the feminization of poverty. So all of these issues were very interrelated. During that period, I was working with um, Asian Center for Women's Human Rights, AWHRC, and um, we were already looking at the issue of sex trafficking of women, which was very rampant in the Philippines and also in other countries. So there was a natural solidarity that linked me to Yayori Matsui and other uh, friends in uh, Korea, in Thailand, in you know, and, and also um, in um, Malaysia. All of us started talking about. Um, you know, women from Southeast Asia being brought uh, to first world countries as, you know, as part of sex trafficking. And within that natural um, linkages, uh, because of the cause, uh, we started to form our own networks. And by 1991, when Kim Haksung came out to tell her story about being a comfort woman during um, the Second World War, I just happened to be in uh, Seoul, Korea, attending a conference on sex trafficking. And so it was really an opening for us to understand that, wow, uh, this was another element of sex trafficking, except it happened during the Second World War. And we were really coping to understand from her testimony, how did it happen, you know? So that propelled us to dig deeper into the issue. Um, we said maybe the best way is to go over the radio in the Philippines and ask if there were women who were raped during the Second World War to please contact us. And we gave Lydia's telephone number and address in our office. We just said that if you were, um, if any of those who are listening to us, I remember those words, um, we are here, uh, we are looking for any women who have been raped during the Second World War, because we would like to document your, your stories, you know, it was just the level of documentation during that time. We were not yet talking about um, justice and compensation. That was not yet in our agenda. We were just thinking, okay, let's document this human, women's human rights violation. So that was when uh, Lola Rosa Henson in the Philippines came out. And because she was the first Filipino comfort women to come out, the media, uh, I mean, really, the, the media in the Philippines um, just really, you know, took her case immediately. So during the press conference, we never expected it. We were expecting just two or three uh, TV companies, but all the Japanese company, uh, TV companies uh, came to the our press conference in Manila and all the TV. And so it became a national issue. Uh, um, um, Rosa Henson became a front page in all the newspapers in the, fan, in, in the Philippines as well as in Japan. And then uh, we started going into um, the television. And she was interviewed a lot. And that is where the story um, impacted other women who listened to her on the radio and on television. And they also started to come out and tell their story. As the issue of the comfort women in the Philippines started to come out and all these women speaking over the radio, over the television, you know, it was really a mass movement of information. Women who were raped during that period actually started to come out as well. And this was the time when I was able to um, uncover the mass rape of Mapanike, which was also uh, brought to the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal. So that catapulted a lot of issues um, at different levels, uh, I would say, um, during that period. And, you know, the, the coming out of the comfort women was on a different level because they were all women in their advanced age, in their 70s, in their 80s, you know, and they 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 were unquestionable you cannot have a grandmother lying you know you you know they 
they just had nothing to lose but tell the truth. I think the importance in handling women who have speak out is that we activists and advocates and as feminists, we have to give them the floor. You know what I mean? They are the main frame of the issue. And so even with us, I remembered with Yayori and, and Yoon jong Uk and all of us activists, every time we are with the comfort women and we are speaking in front of, you know, hundred or a thousand people or so, they were the main speaker and we were in the background either translating or if not, you know, we, we, we had other translators to work with them. So it, the, the center stage was always them, yeah. And even in the press conference, we were only translators and repeating what they said and, and expounding of it, of course. But the point is the center stage was them. And I think that was one, um, I would say a feminist framework that was very important. And then during that time, because I was saying the global um, movement was already, you know, moving in that direction. So the women from former Yugoslavia and Rwanda and other countries who started to speak out also took center stage. So that was a unique time when the survivors themselves came out to tell the horrendous violence that they have gone through. And people had no choice but to really not only sympathize, but to really support them in this struggle. Now, in relation to the strength of the movement itself, it became natural for all of us Asian women working on the issue uh, to really question how this happened. Why are there so many women all of a sudden coming out to tell their story, then you understand and we begin to understand the nature of the silencing of women. We were able to connect that to some of the few testimonies of women who were sex trafficked. We were able to connect that to the women who actually were victims of domestic violence that even them would not come out to tell what happened to them inside their homes because of fear, because of shame, and because there was no mechanism to help and support them and to really save their lives technically. So within that context, we started to learn. We, it was a learning process for us. We didn't know what we were doing. We were basically trying to learn from one another. And that is where the Asian network of women and the movement of it came together. And I think one of the most important factor of that is uniting um, to understand how we can address the issue. Um, looking at what are the mechanisms we can set up to support women who were either victims of sex trafficking or domestic violence or other forms of violence done to women in any context for that matter, because during that time, there were a number of conflicts uh, happening in Cambodia, you know, in, in many other countries. Uh, so that process pushed us to unite and start setting up network naturally. There was no, um, it was just a conscious effort. It was very natural for us to set up the network. So Yayori and our Japanese uh, colleagues who knew of this issue as well and who were really persistent in us linking together, you know, catapulted a whole movement on the comfort women issue. Actually, I have to say that it was the role of um, the Japanese women feminists that pushed us to say, come to Japan, bring this issue to Japan. Without them, we would have never done that. You know, we would have just stayed in our countries and, you know, uh, demand our government. But what they really did and encouraged us is say, no, this is a crime committed by our government 50 years ago. Come to Japan and let the women speak their story. So I think when you look at it, that was the impact of the work that we have done. And I would really say it was because of solidarity. Um, it was because of the unity towards the issue and hence a movement was really developed. By 1993, we have the World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna 
And that was the only time that the United Nations recognized women's human rights as a human rights issue. That was the only time that the United Nations recognized violence against women as a crime against person, you know. So, <clears throat> and of course the development of the special rapporteur on violence against women, but also the United Nation recognized that all past crimes committed against women should continue to be prosecuted. So there were a lot of milestones that we did during that period leading to uh, the Beijing conference in 1995. So the movement, what we had in Asia was also developing in Africa, in Latin America and in North America, because the women have also come out to tell their own stories of violence and rape. So I think that that unity pulled us together and as, as I remember, 1991-92 was also the war in former Yugoslavia and the genocide in Rwanda. So all of this confluence of global events that talk about women, how they have been massacred and raped and killed randomly, systematically, and widespread at the same time, really um, made a difference in the movement itself. It strengthened the movement. We started talking about accountability, but I would just like to say in, in, in this is that the movement made all the difference. Without the movement, we are unable to push, but because there's a movement, we were able to push the governments and the United Nations to recognize these issues. When Kim Haksum came out and told her story, it should be also recognized that the Korean activists, our sisters and brothers in Korea, started to pick at the Japanese embassy in Seoul um, in 1992. And now till today, I would say for the past 28 years, yeah, Koreans, both young and old, have gathered in front of the Japanese embassy in central Seoul every Wednesday making it the world's longest running protest. And I would say the soul of this activism is a legacy that should be handed down from generation to generation um, to acknowledge not only the, the right to justice, but more importantly, uh, to pass on to the next generation that this crime should not be repeated again throughout the world. So the symbol of the picket that is still happening today, every Wednesday in Seoul, Korea, is not just for the comfort women anymore. It's also to send a message globally and around the world to stop sexual violence in war or in armed conflict.